My name is Andrea Brown and I'm president of the Friends of Chesterfield County Public Library. We're celebrating our 50 years of supporting the Public Library of Chesterfield County. The program tonight is our premier virtual program and is made possible through a partnership with Nick Brule, Macmillan Publishers, Kelly Justice and the Fountain Bookstore and Chesterfield County Public Library. The Friends have been very busy during this lockdown year we are raising $20,000 in order to purchase 1,000 new picture books that will be distributed throughout the library system. We're happy to report we're at 87% of the goal. You can help us reach our goal by donating through the Friends website of www.chesterfieldfriends.org. This will also give you information on how you can join the Friends and we certainly welcome your membership. Now, to tell you something about Nick Brule, our author, we are really going to have so much fun. Nick Brule is the author and illustrator of the phenomenally successful and popular Bad Kitty series, including the 2012 and 2013 CBC Children's Choice Book Award winners, Bad Kitty Meets the Baby and Bad Kitty for President. Nick has also mm -hmm. written and illustrated popular picture books, including A Wonderful Year, and Little Red Bird. He lives with his wife and daughter in Winchester, New York. You can stay up to date on Nick Brule's activities through his Facebook page and also his website. During the program, everyone will be muted except for the speakers. Mr. Nick will read us Bedtime for Bad Kitty, tell us about the Bad Kitty series and other books he's written, and maybe show us how he draws the Bad Kitty take, uh, pictures. He, all, he writes his books, but he also does all the illustrations for them too. After he finishes, he'll answer questions sent in when people register for the program. Mary Beth Cox and her son Roy will ask him the questions with assistance from Susan Warsham Moore. You may ask questions through the chat function in Zoom, but the ones sent in through registration will have priority. And after that, I will talk again with some more information and then close the program. Nick Brule, we are so happy to have you here. And so is everybody ready for a bedtime story? Get comfy and enjoy hearing from Mr. Nick. Thank you, Nick. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so thrilled to be here. I'm, I'm gonna open uh, by saying something to all of your patrons, which is congratulations. Congratulations because you have a library in your community. That's a big deal because believe it or not, there are loads and loads of communities all around this country that simply do not have a public library. If you imagine what that might be like, it means not having an access to books, not having an access to information, not having an access to librarians who help us on so many things. So congratulations to you for all of that. But, oh, I'm sorry. I'm tired. Are you tired? I'm tired because I've had a long day and my day is coming to an end. I mean, I've brushed my teeth. I've used a potty. I put on my pajamas. I think I'm gonna end my day by doing four things. First, I'm gonna read a book because I can't think of any better way to end my day than reading a book. Uh, after that, I'm gonna do two drawing exercises. One's gonna have nothing to do with Kitty. The other one's gonna have a lot to do with Kitty. And after that, I'm gonna answer as many questions as I possibly can from you guys, all right? So first I have to decide on what book I'm gonna read. And I think, I thought about this for a while. I think the book I'm gonna read is this one here, Bedtime for Bad Kitty. It's new. When I say new, it's really new. It only came out about a week ago. So you guys are going to be the very first people I have ever read this book out loud to. And to do that, I'm going to go to my handy dandy screen share, where I'm going to read to you from Bedtime for Bad Kitty by Nick Brule. And on the very first page of this book, we see Kitty. And she's looking a little grumpy. When we, not sure why, but when we turn the page, we find out. 
It's bedtime, Kitty. Kitty does not like bedtime. Please brush your teeth, Kitty. Kitty does not want to brush her teeth. Kitty wants to play, 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 play. It's not playtime, Kitty. It's bedtime. Kitty does not like bedtime. If you brush your teeth right now, then there will be enough time for us to read a story together. Kitty does want to hear a story. Kitty brushes her teeth. It's bedtime, Kitty. Please use the potty. Kitty does not want to use the potty. Kitty wants to sing. Sing, 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 sing. It's not sing time, Kitty. It's bedtime. Kitty does not like bedtime. If you use the potty right now, then there will be enough time for us to read a story together. Kitty really does want to hear a story. Kitty uses the potty. It's bedtime, Kitty. Please put on your pajamas. Kitty does not want to put on her pajamas. Kitty wants to run, 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 run. It's not run time, Kitty. It's bedtime. Kitty does not like bedtime. If you put on your pajamas right now, then there will be enough time for us to read a story together. Kitty really, really does want to hear a story. Kitty puts on her pajamas. Thank you for brushing your teeth and using the potty and putting on your pajamas, Kitty. Now we can read a story together. Once upon a time in a faraway land, there was a very beautiful princess who was also very naughty. She didn't like to go to bed. She didn't like to brush her teeth teeth or use the potty or put on her pajamas. She did not like bedtime at all. She was a very naughty princess. But the princess did like stories. This is Kitty's favorite story. Kitty likes stories. Kitty does not like the end to bad kitty bedtime for bad kitty i want to show you a little something that i couldn't really show you on the screen share because if you get this book in the back of the book are two pages of paper doll cutouts where you may remember that kitty needed a little encouragement to put on her pajamas, but this time you can actually help Kitty to put on her pajamas and her slippers too. But I recommend you wait until morning to do that because right now, I guess it's bedtime. Still, before we do that, I wanna show you a drawing exercise. It's a sort of exercise that you can do at home. You can do it by yourself. You can do it with a group. I do it on my own. I do it with my daughter. I do it with the whole family sometimes. It's a drawing exercise I call Chimera. Before I show you the exercise itself, let's define our terms. Exactly what is a Chimera? A Chimera was a mythological beast, meaning it did not exist. It was a mythological creature from ancient Greece. 
And it, ha it, it was a fascinating looking thing because it was an amalgam, a collection of different animals that were sort of smashed together to form one creature. So it was typically depicted as having the head and the body of a lion, but it had a second head, that of a goat. It was usually sticking out from right between the, the shoulder blades, right behind the lion's head. And then instead of a tail, it was a snake or a serpent. Um, oh, and before I forget, uh, the goat head, the one I was just telling you about, it could breathe fire because apparently that's what goats could do back in ancient Greece. Anyway. Uh, you don't need a lot for this exercise. You need, of course, something to draw with. I'm going to use this marker. And then you need at least two sheets of paper. Now, one sheet, of course, is for drawing on. The other sheet you're going to cut up into pieces. And then onto each piece of paper, you write the name of an animal. So for instance, uh, let's see, a goldfish, snake. Now, I like to put the pieces of paper into a bowl because it's kind of fun for me to shuffle my hands around, but you can also just stack them like a deck of cards. Now, to demonstrate this exercise, I'm now going to pick three pieces of paper, three animals from this bowl, and they are going to comprise my chimera. Okay, so let's find out. You're going to find out what I get the same time I do. All right, the first animal I chose was elephant. That's a good one. The elephant is going to be the head of my chimera. All right, let's see what else we get. Oh, all right. Horse. The horse is going to be the body of my chimera. Interesting. Last one. Oh, I've never got, well, no, I've gotten it, but not for the feet. I got this. The third animal I chose is duck. And the duck is going to be the legs, and in this case, web feet of my chimera. Now, in order to show you the drawing exercise itself, I'm now gonna switch over to my handy dandy fancy schmancy document camera. See you in a moment. All right, so just to review, these are the three animals I chose, elephant, horse, and duck. They're going to be the head, body, and legs of my chimera. I've got them committed to memory, so now I'm going to do the drawing. Um, but do you remember the first animal I chose? That was elephant. And the elephant is going to be the head of my chimera. And elephants, of course, have very long trunks. They also have little hairs at the ends of their trunks. When they have these tusks, sometimes I forget to put the tusk in. Uh, Another terrific feature of the elephant is they have these terrific ears. I mean, they're as big as the elephant itself is. And they're big and wide and floppy and they are wonderful. So that's the head of my chimera, the elephant. Now it gets interesting because now I start drawing the body of my chimera. And as you recall, the body of my chimera is a horse. Now horses are very different, have very different bodies than uh, elephants. But to sort of emphasize that this is a horse, I'm gonna give it a saddle. And I guess some, a couple of stirrups. All right. And we're gonna give it uh, sort of a horse tail. They're both mammals. So I guess the horse uh, body isn't gonna be that different, but still this is where it gets even more interesting because do you remember the third animal I chose? That's right, the duck and ducks unquestionably have very different legs than uh, elephants and horses. For one thing, they're birds, they're waterfowl, so they have only two legs, two feathery legs. And we're gonna emphasize feathers here. And we're gonna give them the webbed feet. 
And I think we're going to stop there. I could go on for hours if I wanted to, but we got other things to do. But besides, I think this is my chimera is complete. This is my chimera that is based on the head of an elephant, the body of a horse, and the legs of a duck. I just have two more things to do before I am totally finished. The first thing I have to do is name my chimera. Now I could take the easy route and just, just name this guy George or Nancy, but I think I'm gonna name this chimera after the animals that comprise it. So I have an elephant, a horse, and a duck. I'm gonna name this chimera uh, an Ella. Or duck. That seems to work. This is an Ella Horduck. If anyone ever asks you what an Ella Horduck looks like, you can draw them one of these. The very last thing that I have to do before I finish is sign my name. Because anytime you make any drawing or write a story, anytime you do anything creative, you really need to attach your name to it somehow. So I've got a lot of room right here. So this is where I will sign my name, which, as you all know, is Mo Willem, excuse me, Nick rule. Well, hopefully that looked like fun. It occurs to me that there are several different variations to this exercise that you can try if you choose to do this on your own. Now, I did this by myself. You can do this as a group, and here is how. Same tools, something to draw with, something to draw on. Then it gets interesting because the first person picks an animal, and draws the head of the chimera, but then passes the paper down to the second person who picks a different animal and draws the body of the chimera, then passes the paper down to the third person who picks a different animal for the legs and so on and so forth. Now, I only chose three animals, right? Imagine how amazing your chimera would look if you picked four or five or maybe even more animals than that. Which brings me to another interesting point. I only uh, wrote down the names of animals on my paper. I've never tried this. Maybe you can. Um, instead of writing an animal, every now and then write down something that is not an animal, like maybe broccoli or cauliflower or Batman or maybe even your mom. Although, having said that, I hereby absolve myself of any responsibility. If you get into trouble because you drew a chimera with the face of your mom, the neck of a giraffe, and so on and so forth, be it on your head, not mine, that is legally binding. Let's draw Kitty. Now, here's the thing. I promised myself before I came on with you that I wasn't going to be the guy who got a marker and then a nice piece of paper and said to you, all right, folks, here, this is how you draw bad kitty. No. See, because I want to make it substantive. I, I want you to learn something from this. And, and, and just watching me draw bad kitty, will it'll show you how I draw cats, but it won't necessarily show you how you can draw your own cats. So this is what I'm going to do. Um, I am going to draw a kitty. But in doing so, I want to show you the hardest part. I want to show you the biggest challenge that I face each and every time that I draw this character, and that is giving her feelings, emotions. See, feelings and emotions are really important. Every single character in every single story you have ever read, you were ever going to read, they all needed feelings and emotions to seem real. But I've got a problem. It's kind of a big problem. My problem is that I created a character who does not talk. Kitty does not talk. She's a cat. But because she doesn't talk, she can't just tell us what she's thinking. She can't just tell us what she's feeling. The only way to know what Kitty is thinking or feeling is by seeing the expressions on her face. That's my challenge. I'm going to show you how I meet this challenge each and every single time. How, you ask? Why, with the help of my handy-dandy fancy-smancy document camera, of course. 
let's draw kitty so now here's the thing when i draw kitty i always start in the middle of her face with that part of the body we call the elbow um hold on that that doesn't sound right i, I need to review hold on Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, and eyes, and ears, and mouth, and nose, nose, that's her nose. I knew that. Nose. I'm just, I'm tired. I told you. It's a long day. Now, below her nose, I'm going to draw her mouth. Now, above her nose, I'm going to draw these two circles. And these two circles, of course, are her gallbladder. Um, that, that doesn't sound right either. Hold on. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes, knees, and toes, and eyes, and eyes, eyes. Those are her eyes. I knew that. Again, long day. Now, above her eyes, I draw these sort of four hairy deals. Next come her ears. Now, my research shows that all ears, all cats have two ears. So we always give her two ears, if only for the sake of scientific authenticity. Next come the whiskery deals. And you may notice that the two in the middle are a little longer than the others, kind of balances her head nicely. And we're gonna close up with her skinny neck, shoulders, and that little tuft of white fur on her chest. And that's Kitty. Hello, Kitty. I'm not really done yet. You see, because I call this blank faced kitty. She doesn't really have an expression here. You, know, right? you can't look at this face and know for sure what she's thinking. You certainly cannot look at this face and know for sure what she is feeling. That is about to change because with a single stroke of this marker, I'm gonna turn this blank expressionless kitty into annoyed kitty. This is going to happen quickly, so pay attention. Here we go. No expression. Annoyed. In case you missed it the first time. No expression. Annoyed. No expression. Annoyed. See, the smallest detail can have a huge difference. It's knowing where to put that detail. That's my challenge. To further illustrate this point, literally, whoops, I'm gonna do this three more times. Now, to save time, I'm not gonna draw her whole head. I'm not gonna bother with the ears or the hair or the, even the whiskers. I'm just gonna draw the important components of her face. But you may have already noticed that those two circles, her gallbladder, excuse me, her eyes, making them a little bigger than I did that first time. And I'm doing this three times. All right. I have three kitty faces. They're pretty much the same. They're pretty much identical. But obviously they're also incomplete. Something is still missing. By the time I am finished, this first one is going to be surprised kitty. Okay. This next one here is going to be crazy kitty. All right. And this last one here is going to be adorable kitty. All right. Ready? Here we go. First things first, surprised kitty. Okay. One. Two. That was easy, but check this out. It's my favorite part. All I did was add two dots. And just by adding two dots, look at how much more alive that face becomes compared to the other two. I never get tired of that. All right, next, crazy kitty. You ready? Here we go. One, two. That's not so hard, right? Last but not least, adorable kitty. One, two. I had three kitty faces. 
They used to be the same. They used to be identical. By the time I was done, the only difference between surprised, crazy, and adorable was where I put the dots for her eyes and how big I made them. Learning these details, the ones that make such a huge difference, took me a lot of time, a lot of practice. It remains to this day the hardest part of my job when I have to draw this character. I now open the floors to questions from you guys. Thank you. All right. Hello, well, hello, hello, Mr. Nick. How hello. are you? Good. Wow, that was that was so fun. You should show him he was drawing Bad Kitty the whole time. Oh, marvelous. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, that's magnificent. Excellent job, Roy. Thank yeah. you. Wonderful. So, hello to everybody else who is here with us tonight. Thank you for being here. Um, again, my name is Mary Beth Cox. I am on the board of the Friends of the Chesterfield County Public Library. I'm here with my son, Roy. And we are going to read you some questions that have been sent in by our audience. So some of the kiddos who sent in questions are named Wild, Silas, Barrett, and Samuel. So thank you to them and to everybody else who submitted their questions tonight. So Roy, do you want to start with the first question, please? The first question is, how did you come up with the idea for Bad Kitty? Is it based on your own pet? Oh, that's an excellent question. Um, there's really two questions in there, and I'll answer the second one first. Uh, the kitty is not based on any particular cat, and I can say that sincerely because when I wrote the very first Bad Kitty book, which was a picture book simply called Bad Kitty, I did not own a cat at the time. However, she was modeled, physically modeled after a cat I had when I was a little boy named Zuzu. That is the cat was named Zuzu, not me, anyway. Uh, Zuzu was a little black cat. Uh, she, was, she had this wonderful design. She was black all over from the tip of her ears to the tip of her tail everywhere except for this elegant tuft of white fur on her chest. And I always thought it looked like she was wearing a piece of jewelry. So when I came up with the idea for the Bad Kitty, first Bad Kitty story, uh, I thought I would physically model uh, kitty after this cat Zuzu. As to when I came, how I came up with the idea for Kitty itself, at Kitty itself, that's a different story. See, um, when it's time for me to sit down and write a story, believe it or not, I do not begin with the story first. I don't begin with the plot or the character, the setting or anything. I act more often than not, and this is the absolute truth. I begin with the title first. I'll tell you why this is. If you've ever tried to write a story, you might find that writing a story can be kind of difficult, but writing a title, writing a title can be very simple because a title could be just one or two words. So this is how it happened. It was about 18 years ago now. I was sitting at home. I was sitting at my desk. I had a big blank sheet of paper in front of me, had a pen in my hand. And instead of writing a story, I thought, I'm just going to write down titles. Titles I'd never seen before, titles I didn't think even existed. So that's what I did. I just started writing them down as it came to me, just one or two word titles, title assigned, title after title after title after title. And after a while, I wrote down some titles that I kind of liked. And I wrote down some titles that I kind of didn't like. But then I wrote down one title that I really liked. That title was Bad Kitty. I loved that title. So that's when I had to start asking myself questions, which is kind of the most important thing about writing stories. And the first question I had to ask myself was, okay, if I've got a cat, I've got a title to a story called Bad Kitty. What does this cat do that is so bad? That was when I came up with, I started writing them down and I came up with so many ideas. I thought it would be interesting if I put them into alphabetical order. I said, okay, 
I asked myself the next important question, which was why? Why would this cat do so many terrible things? Well, knowing cats as I did, um, their behavior is often influenced by their food. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna do an alphabet of foods that this cat does not like. So, and that is how the very first Bad Kitty book took shape. Arguably, that is how this entire Bad Kitty empire was born, purely from my contemplating those two little words when I was about 18 years ago, bad and kitty. Great questions, thank you. Wow. Thank you. All right, let's go to our next question. How long did it take you to write Bedtime for Bad Kitty? Oh, interesting. How long did it take me to write Bedtime for Bad Kitty? Um, more often than not, when it's time for me to sit down and write um, a, a story, it takes me a long time. The chapter books, for instance, because they're much longer, some of them are as long as 160 pages, those can take me six to nine months to write and illustrate. I do both. Bedtime for Bad Kitty is a little different because it's a shorter story and it's only 24 pages. And as you can tell, the language is repeated a lot. Kitty does not like bedtime. And I did that on purpose because this story is designed for a much younger audience. So Bedtime for Bad Kitty, much like a lot of the um, other what they call eight by eights, which are these picture books I've done. And they all start with titles like Bad Kitty Does Not Like Candy, Bad Kitty Does Not Like Dogs and so forth. Took me really more like a couple days to write and then about a month to do the drawings. And that's where I get lucky because for, for these simple picture books that we've been doing, I don't even have to do the color. Um, we give the, the, my line art, the drawings I make to a very talented man named Rob Steen. And Rob Steen, he can professionally drop color in to all the illustrations using a computer. Um, I don't have to do that. I don't have that skill. For, for, all the, for my picture books and for all the Bad Kitty um, uh, black and white books, I hand painted those. I don't know how to do the, the digital coloring at all. That's up to Rob and he does a great job. So to answer the question, took me all of about a full month to write and illustrate Bedtime for Bad Kitty. Okay, great, thank you. Next question. What made you want to tell stories and be a writer? Oh, what an interesting question. Um, it's absolute truth. When I was in first grade, there was nothing I enjoyed doing more than sitting at the table with a big blank sheet of paper in front of me with a pen, pencil, crayon, whatever, get little hands on in my hand and writing and drawing stories. I, I, I truly enjoyed doing those things. And, and one of the reasons I loved writing and drawing stories so much was that even back then, it, it, it occurred to me that when I wrote a story or I made a drawing, that story, that drawing did not exist until I created it. And I mean that literally, right? I mean, think about it in the entire history of the universe, uh, that story, that drawing did not exist until you made it yourself. And that's kind of an awesome feeling. So that's what I would do in first grade. I would sit and I'd write and I'd draw stories. And I kept writing and drawing stories in second grade and third grade, and then fourth and fifth grade. I, I, I was writing and drawing stories in uh, middle school, high school, college. And even, even all those years since college, I've been writing and drawing stories all my life. And I do it because I love it. It turns out that I love it as much now as I did when I was in first grade. It's a great question though, thank you. All right, I think we're gonna go to a question from our live audience right now. And this is from Owen. So thank you, Owen, for your question. Is the character Uncle Murray real? 
Oh, what a great question. Thank you for asking that one, Owen. Um, the simple answer is yes, but if in case you haven't noticed yet, I am not prone to giving simple answers. Let me tell you the story about why Uncle Murray exists. Uncle Murray first appeared in the very first Bad Kitty book, the picture book, Bad Kitty. And if you don't know the book, it's a very simple story about a cat who does not get the food she wants one day. And the food is listed in alphabetical order. I told you about how that, and I was inspired by that. So in retaliation, she commits all these acts of mayhem in alphabetical order. But then she does get the food she wants in alphabetical order, and she more or less makes amends in alphabetical order. When I got to the letter U in the alphabet of foods and animals this cat wanted to eat, I was stuck. I could not think of a food or an animal that started with the letter U. I mean, they're unicorns. They don't really exist. It didn't seem to fit with my book. So I thought about it for a long time. And when I say a long time, I mean talking a lot, several days. And it occurred to me, wouldn't it be interesting if for the letter U, I wrote uncle somebody. If I was going to write uncle anybody, it had to be my own real life Uncle Murray. See, because when I was, I was, when I was uh, Roy's age, for instance, I had a real life Uncle Murray and, and I depict him as I remember him. He was big and doughy. Um, he was mostly bald. Uh, I would visit him at home. So he was always walking around in his pajama pants and a stained gray t-shirt. And I love my Uncle Murray. My Uncle Murray used to tell me all sorts of stories that were possibly inappropriate for my age about his friendship with a famous Hollywood comedy team called Abbott and Costello. Now, a lot of you kids, Roy, do you know who Abbott and Costello are? No. Does your mom know who Abbott and Costello are? Sorta. That's gonna. That's sort of the trend. Most kids, most students don't know who Abbott and Costello are. Most grown-ups, moms, dads, teachers, the grown-ups in your world, they may or they probably do know how Abbott and Costello are. So I'm giving everyone a little assignment. Don't worry, you'll like it. Try to find a movie. Maybe it's streaming somewhere. Maybe you'd have to rent it. Maybe even purchase it. It's worth it. Find a movie called Abbott and Costello Meet Frankenstein. If you like funny movies, you will love this movie. If you like scary movies, it's not too scary. You will love this movie. And while you are watching Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, you can point to the screen and you can say, hey, those two guys used to play poker every Thursday night with the real life Uncle Murray. That was my Uncle Murray. Great question. I'm so glad someone asked it. Thank you, Owen. All right. Well, Roy has decided we're going to take another one from the audience. Noah asks, what is it like to be a writer? What's the hardest part and what's the best part? Oh, that's a, you know, that is a fascinating question. Uh, and I'm not sure if any, you would think it's an obvious question, but I'm not entirely clear if anyone has ever asked me that question before. I think the hardest part, I, well, I should say, I think there are two things that come to mind being the most, the biggest challenge for writing stories. The first is that you need to be very patient. I have novels, for instance, that I started writing um, upwards on three years ago that I keep going back to that I hope, but I have no guarantee will ever see publication. But I go back to them when in between Bad Kitty books and I refine them and I show them to my editor and she gives me changes and I work on them. And so you do have to be patient because something that you're going to work on now, it may not see it may not become a book, the kind of thing that you can hold in your hands or see on the shelves of your library, the shelves of your bookstore for years. Even if I have a terrific bad kitty idea today, it's going to take me, depending on the book, several months to write and illustrate. And then I won't, and then even after my work is done, it'll be a whole year before that book comes out. So 
being patient is not easy. The second thing that comes to mind that's a challenge for being a writer is that you have to be used to being by yourself. Doing what I do, I have to be able to close the door and not be with anybody for hours. So you really have to be used to being entirely by yourself. It's really necessary to the work you have to do. As for the fun part, um, it's a, maybe the best part of it is doing what I'm doing right now. And this is where I'm lucky because I write books for kids. And because I write books for kids, it means I'm invited to schools. I'm invited to libraries. And I could do this every day if I chose to. And boy, is that terrific. Because people who write books for grown-ups, the opportunity to meet with their own readers, that kind of comes infrequently, sometimes not at all. But writing books for kids, because kids are in schools and such, I get this opportunity to talk to kids, to talk to my readers a lot. And that is wonderful. I don't take that for granted. Thank you for those questions. All right, we have a few more. All right. Okay, you wanna to go to the next one? It's a good one. Are you a dog person or a cat person? Oh, you know, I don't think I'm a one or the other kind of person. I do like dogs and I do like cats. Um, we don't have a dog anymore, but boy, did we have a good one. He was a great little guy named Toby. And I immortalized him in Bad Kitty Camp Days. In Bad Kitty Camp Days, there was this very uh, bossy little Dachshund that was named Toby, very much uh, modeled after our own uh, bossy little Dasha and Toby. And I loved watching how he interacted with the cats we had. It, you know, because one of the great things about Toby and dogs is that Toby, for instance, he desperately wanted to play with the cats. And the cats themselves were actually moderately interested in playing with the dog. The only trouble was that they couldn't decide on what game to play because Toby wanted to play his favorite game, which was called Bitey Bitey Wrestle. That looked very messy to the cats. They didn't want to have anything to do with that because they wanted to play their favorite game, which was called Swatty Swatty Gouge. And that looked very dangerous to the dog. He still had one good eye left. He wanted to keep it and, and he had no interest in that. So all power to these animals in the house. They, 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 they always tried. At least once a day, they would run into each other and we'd be the same thing each and every single time, bitey, bitey, wrestle, swatty, swatty, gouge. They get a little freaked out. They go their separate ways, but they keep trying. They would try. They were persistent. Every day they would try again. Interesting question. Thank you. All right. This is Andrea. Yeah. I think we have time for one more question. One more question. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, I think we've picked a good one. What advice would you give to someone who wants to write their first book? Ah, okay. That is a terrific question. And uh, it's interesting. I only just started, it wasn't until recently that people started asking me that question. The advice I would give is just two words. Very simply, two words, be brave. But those two words, be brave, have two different meanings. The first is you need to be brave in the kind of story you want to write. Be brave in, in if it's your own story, then be brave enough to tell it. Don't worry about whether you think it's something that will interest other people, write it and make it your own. But the other way I mean the words be brave is once you write your story, you have to be brave enough to share it with the, someone near to you. Maybe it's your mom, maybe it's your dad, maybe it's your teacher, maybe it's a friend. But the point is you have to share it because if you ever, because in theory, if you ever want to be a published author, then you will be sharing your story with the entire world. And 
to be honest, that is a very, very difficult step for a lot of people. For instance, I have an excellent, I have a very good friend. She is a brilliant writer. Only I'm very concerned that no one else aside from myself or her husband will ever really know this because she becomes so timid in sharing her story with other people, other people she doesn't know or trust as much as me or her husband, that she just doesn't do it. And I think a lot of people are like her. And I think I find that almost tragic. Anyway, be brave. Be brave enough to share your stories and be brave enough in the kind of stories you want to tell. Good luck to anyone who wants to write. Thank you, Nick. You've given us a lot to think about. Um, I'm talking to our audience now and I want some bad kitty books. I want some Nick Gruel kitty books. I want books by Mr. Gruel. And so what's the easiest way to get them? If you want to own them for your home library, you can uh, talk to the folks at Fountain Bookstore and you can go to fountainbookstore.com and order them. If you'd like to borrow them from the library, you can do that too. Chesterfield County Public Library has 10 branches and you can go there and get books to keep for a couple of weeks, put them, take them back and get some more. So there's lots of ways that you can read some of Mr. Bull's books. Um, before we close completely though, we've got some thank yous I need to give. And first of all, we thank you, Nick. We've had a great time with you this evening and thank you for giving us wise words as well as lots of information about your books. Um, thank you to Mary Beth and to Roy and to Susan. Um, I want to say thank you to Macmillan Publishing and also to Kelly Justice and her staff at Fountain Books, to Chesterfield County Public Library and to the friends of Chesterfield County Public Library and to the Friends 50th Anniversary Committee that put this program together, especially Kathy Geranius, Mary Beth Cox, and Cahill Dote. I'd like, you, I'd like to remind you to visit the Friends website to learn more about the Picture Book Fundraiser and contribute if you'd like. And it has information about joining the Friends. And again, we would love to have you join. Our website is www.chesterfieldfriends.org. Now, it's about time to say goodbye. Nick, thank you so much for being with us. It's been a wonderful evening. And I want to say good evening to everybody. Thank you for being with us. Best wishes from the Friends of the Library and sweet dreams to everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. I'm gonna close by saying a couple things. The first is that okay. unless I'm mistaken, I believe if you, go, if you purchase a book from that store, it will include a signed book plate by me, which will include a drawing of Kitty, much like what I did earlier this evening. Um, the last thing I wanna say, uh, aside from good night, is um, I so look forward to the day that I can meet with all of you in person. I really do. Uh, I don't know exactly when that day will come. However, I guarantee that it will. Until then, Please be well, be safe, wash your hands, wear a mask if necessary. I will see you someday soon. Good night. We look forward to that. Thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night, Nick. Good night, everybody.